The Witcher show on Netflix captivated a very large audience, with a big chunk of it being fans who are completely new to the series. And of course, when you're just starting out with a new series, it's tough to immediately understand all aspects of a whole unexplored and enormous fantasy world like The Witcher has. So I'm gonna try to help you guys out with some of that. In this video, I will give you a better idea of where every location visited or mentioned in the show is on the map and in relation to each other. I will talk a little bit about the politics and wars, and I will also go through it in a chronological order, according to the official timeline. Now, keep in mind that this video will only include show canon, so any events or locations that I mention might differ from books and video games canon. Also, even though there's many different versions of the map, I will be using the one that was officially created for the show. Last but not least, this video of course contains spoilers for the entire first season of The Witcher show on Netflix, so if you haven't watched it yet, don't click off the video, but just save it on your Watch Later playlist. Yeah, play it smart. You're now watching Because Geek. Okay, so as a quick overview, this is the entire continent where the story takes place. And as you can see, it extends from the Dragon Mountains in the north to Nilfgaard in the south, and from the Blue and Fiery Mountains in the east to the Great Sea in the west. There's likely more locations beyond these boundaries, but due to a lack of technology, little of them has been explored. Other than this, you can divide the continent into two parts, Anything below the Amal Mountains here is considered a Southern Kingdom, and anything above it is considered a Northern Kingdom. To the south, the only place that you should really be paying attention to is Nilfgaard. And in the north, we have many, many small kingdoms that you will or have heard about already, but there are also four major ones that form the Great Kingdoms, and these are Temeria, Redania, Aedirn, and Caedwen. Sintra, where most of the present storyline takes place, is one of the smaller kingdoms and it is right here. But yeah, let's get started for real now. The very first scene that we can place on the timeline is Yennefer's introduction in the year 1206, which happens where she was born, in Vengeberg. Vengeberg is the capital city of Aedirn, one of the great kingdoms that we mentioned earlier, and this becomes important for her later. When Yennefer accidentally used her portal opening powers, she ended up finding Istrid, who was a student at the Banart Academy in Caedwen, another one of the Great Kingdoms. Which means that Yennefer traveled just a bit up north from where she was. She is then found by Tisea back in Vengeberg, and taken to the Aretusa Academy on Thanet Island in the other Great Kingdom, Temeria. She remained here for the next five or so years, until she went through her transformation, and soon after attended the royal ceremony where she first met the king of Aedirn at the time, King Virforil. This is where Yennefer being from Aedirn comes into play, because other than her newly acquired beauty, of course, announcing that she was from Vengeberg was what made King Virforil choose her over Fringilla as his mage. After that royal ceremony, while Yennefer served as a mage in Aedirn's court, a few major events happened. In 1213, Princess Renfri was born in Creighton up here under the curse of the Black Sun. In 1216, we get the birth of Princess Calanthe in Sintra over here. Then, in 1222, we have the birth of Yaskir, potentially in the kingdom of Kerak here, but we don't really have canon confirmation for this yet. In 1229, King Foltest's cursed child turns into a striga in Vizima, the capital city of Temeria. Calanthe's ascension to the throne at a mere 15 years old happens in 1230, and soon after she gains her first battle victory in Hochbus against the Nazare military, which apparently was a very trivial battle fought over money or something like that. Then finally, in 1231, the show gives us our first Geralt event on the timeline, when we see him trying to make some money by killing a Kikimora in the swamps and then taking its corpse to a town called Blaviken. At this point in the timeline, Blaviken isn't quite yet part of Redania, the fourth major kingdom, but it will be in the future. Which is more of a fun fact than a spoiler, but yeah. As you know, in Blaviken, Geralt meets Renfri, the now all grown up and battle hardened exiled princess. He also meets the sorcerer Stregobor in his tower, and subsequently makes history in this town by becoming the Butcher of Blaviken. So yeah. This right here is where all of that happens and where Geralt starts off in the show. 
In the following year, Quintalanthi marries Ragnar, who was from Eben, a southern kingdom that you might remember being mentioned in the show a few times, but we'll get to that in a bit. Then, the year after marrying the Queen of Sintra, Ragnar had an accident while hunting in the Erlenwald forest. Fortunately for him, Duni was in the area and was able to save his life. This prompted Duni to take on the name of Lord Archeon of Erlenwald, and it would also be the event that tied Duni to Pavetta by the law of surprise. Logically, the next event would be Princess Pavetta's actual birth, in Sintra, in 1234. In 1237, the Striga attacks began in Vizima, and it'll be a while before Geralt makes his way there, so they had some pretty rough years to get through. Two years later, in 1239, one of the most important events in the story happened, and this was Nilfgaard taking Ebin. So this is why I wanted to bring attention to those mentions of Ebin in the show, because this was the first major move made by the Nilfgaardian Empire on their way north, and is considered to be the beginning of the First Great War. While all of that stuff was going on, in 1240, Geralt found himself roaming around the edge of the world and making a stop at the town of Posada, where he first encountered his not-so-soon-to-be best friend forever, Yaskir. As you might remember, this is also where the Toss a Coin to Your Witcher song was created after Geralt and Yaskir dealt with the Sylvan and Filavandril, the king of the elves, which greatly improved Geralt's reputation after what happened in Blaviken. We can hop back over to Yennefer's journey now, because the next event on the timeline is hers, when she was protecting Queen Callis on their way to Lyria in that same year. Lyria will go through some political changes in the future, but for now it is yet another one of the smaller independent kingdoms in the north. In 1243, six long years after the Striga attacks began, Geralt was finally recruited by Triss in Vizima to deal with the task of saving King Folte's daughter, which of course he was successful at. We don't exactly know what he was up to for the next six years, but it was in 1249 when he attended Pavetta's banquet in Sintra. This event became a turning point in Geralt's life when his destiny was tied to Pavetta's daughter, Ciri, by the law of surprise. Fuck. That same night, not only did Pavetta marry Urchion, but Kalanthi also married Ace Tursak, which started a powerful alliance between Sintra and Skellige, where Aist is from. Queen Kalanthi now had the Skelligan fleet at her disposal. In 1250, Princess Cyrilla was born in Skellige. And in the meantime, Destiny was working behind the scenes to make another major event happen in 1256. Geralt and Yennefer's first encounter in Rind, which is where Yennefer was trying to be an off-the-grid mage and where she and Geralt had to deal with a djinn. Rind is a town in the northern kingdom of Redania. About six years later, in 1262, a lot further north, Geralt, accompanied by Yaskir, met Yennefer again when they both joined the dragon hunt in Cangorn. Cangorn is yet another small northern kingdom. After this encounter and fallout with Geralt, Yennefer goes looking for Istrid again, who she hasn't seen in many years, and she finds him in Nazair, working for Nilfgaard. The fact that Nilfgaard forces are now stationed in Nazair after taking Ebin should be raising some alarms for the north. Potentially thanks to being called out by Yennefer for not taking his child surprise seriously, Geralt returns to Sintra about a year after that last fight with Yen, in 1263. Unfortunately for Geralt, right after he gets a glimpse of the real Ciri, Queen Calanthe ends up locking him up in the dungeons of the castle. Now this is where we finally reach present time in the show, so every event from here on happens this same year, and things really do ramp up. Soon after imprisoning Geralt, Queen Calanthe's worst nightmares come true during the last banquet celebration. Ace tells her that the Nilfgaardian force crossed the Amal Pass after being stationed in Nazir, which, as I just mentioned, was cause for concern because, last they heard, Nilfgaard had taken Eben, and if they're crossing the Amal Pass now, that means they're definitely trying to take the Northern Kingdoms as well. Queen Calanthe is still feeling pretty confident, though, thanks to having 50 Skelligan ships at the ready in case Nilfgaard comes for Sintra. According to her, heading for Sodden would be a smarter move for Nilfgaard, but as we know now, with how badly Cahir wanted Ciri, that was never going to be the case. The next day, 
the Nilfgaardian army not only reached Sintra, but also destroyed the Skelligan fleet that she was counting on. This was an instrumental move in the defeat of the Sintran army at the Battle of Manardal Valley, deciding as well the soon-to-be fate of Sintra. Sintra's defeat at Marnadal prompted an emergency magical gathering in Aretusa, where the Brotherhood of Sorcerers met to deliberate whether they should help Sintra or not against Nilfgaard. Yennefer was present here because, while she was in Nazaire, she was tricked by Vilgefortz into returning to Aretusa. Sadly, the Brotherhood voted to leave Sintra to fend for itself, but after the meeting was done, Tisea convinced those who did want to help to head to Sudden Hill with her the place where it was clear the Nilfgaardian army would move to next, as it is the only location in the vicinity where crossing the Yaruga River is possible. Unsurprisingly, Nilfgaard was successful at taking Sintra, the event that would later be called the Slaughter of Sintra, and this is where Ciri's journey begins. After she barely escaped from Cahir, she headed north, meeting Dara on the way, and eventually reaching the Sintran refugee camp. Unfortunately, Nilfgaard found this camp almost immediately, and Ciri, saved from the attack by Dara, was forced to run away further north. Around this point, she started to get really close to the Broculon forest, and this is where she heard the voices calling out to her. After spending her time with the Dryads there, getting tricked by the Doppler who was pretending to be Mausak, escaping that, and then being abandoned by Dara, Ciri continued her journey alone, eventually arriving in Bruges. It was in this location where she had her prophecy event, and where she kills the men who were about to assault her, with that big explosion caused by her hidden powers. At this point, Geralt had escaped Sintra's slaughter as well, and also headed north. While roaming around one of the Sintra refugee camps at night, he met Jurga, a merchant who wanted to bury the dead. The smell of the corpses, however, attracted ghouls to the area, before Jurga could get much of it done, and Geralt decided to stay and fight them off. He was gravely injured in the fight, but he managed to save the merchant's life, and Geralt was once again offered the love surprise as payment. After Ciri woke up from her prophecy event in Bruges, a woman that just so happens to be Jurga's wife gives her refuge. This happens at the same time that Geralt is being taken care of by Jurga, and also pretty much at the same time that Nilfgaard finally reaches Southern Hill, where Tisea, Yen, and the rest of the mages were ready and waiting for them. That battle lasted all night, and it was devastating for the mages who took numerous losses, but it wasn't much better for the Nilfgaardian army, who was also forced to fall back and regroup. In the morning, Geralt woke up feeling brand new. He was, somehow, healed by his own mother during the night, and then continued on his journey with Jurga, arriving to the merchant's home soon after. This is when the love surprise was once again fulfilled between Geralt and Ciri, once Ciri became what Jurga found at home that he did not expect. And so, finally, destiny achieved its goal of having Geralt and Ciri find each other. This is where all the character journeys end. But there were a few other important locations mentioned throughout the show. One big one that we haven't touched on yet is in Geralt's own name, Geralt of Rivia. Where are you from, Geralt? Rivia. I don't know where that is, but I could learn if you'd let me. No. So where the heck is Rivia? Right here. And at this point, it's still its own small northern kingdom. Yes, there's many, many northern kingdoms. Another big one all the way over here would be Kaer Morhen, which was mentioned by Geralt to Kalanthi during the banquet, which, long story short, is a witcher school, and sort of his home, and we're definitely going to see a lot of it in season 2. You might remember Geralt asking Jurga to take him to the Blue Mountains as well, when he was riding in the back of his wagon. This is because he wanted to get to Kaer Morhen, but damn, look at where Geralt was when he said that. Being taken to Kaer Morhen from there was maybe a little bit too much to ask for, buddy. And the last location I will show you is Toussaint, which was mentioned by Tisea here. And you, you spare your niece her duties? Not enough fragrance in Toussaint to take the stench off that nepotism. 
and is the setting where the Blood and Wine DLC for The Witcher 3 video game takes place. Quite the beautiful location. And hey, other than video games, there are books too. If you'd like to read them before watching the show and you don't have them, I've got links in the description for you to buy them. I would recommend Blood of Elves, since Season 2 of The Witcher show on Netflix will be mostly based on that book. But yeah, with that, I bid you adieu. Hope your Witcher sense of location has improved at least a little bit after watching this video. Huge shout out to all of my patrons who stuck around with me this whole time. Thank you guys, you're amazing. Cheers everyone, stay cool, take care, and I will see you in the next one. In the next one.